Welcome everyone to the continuing education video for rotator cuff repair rehabilitation. My name is Carissa Dyer and I am joined by my colleagues Emily Hubner, Anna Napsiger, and Elizabeth Wolmer. So to start us off, we are going to simply define the topic of rotator cuff repair. And this is defined as a surgery to repair a torn tendon in the shoulder. The procedure can be done with a large open incision with a shoulder arthroscopy, which uses smaller incisions. And this type of injury is the most common musculoskeletal injury. And it affects at least 10% of people over the age of 60 in the United States. And it is estimated that 250,000 rotator cuff repairs are performed in the US per year. There are many treatment options that include non-operative management, arthroscopic debridement with a biceps tenopi or tendinesis, partial repair, complete repair, patch augmentation, superior capsular reconstruction, muscle tendon transfer, and reverse total shoulder arthroscopy, arthroplasty. Based on the most recent data in 2020, rotator cuff tears affect 9.7% of people who are 20 years old and younger, and this percentage st steadily increases to about 80% in adults 80 years old and older. Most total tears requiring surgical repair result from an acute trauma in adults under 40. Although the older adult population has a much higher prevalence rate for rotator cuff tears, many are partial or asymptomatic tears that do not require surgical repair. Some of the, the most common risk factors that increase the chance of sustaining a rotator cuff tear include smoking, family history of rotator cuff disease, poor posture, physical trauma, high cholesterol, and occupations or activities requiring significant or repetitive overhead activity. Rotator cuff tears can primarily be classified into two types. A partial thickness tear is damage to the soft tissue, but not a complete rupture of the tendon, while a full thickness tear is a complete rupture of one or more of the rotator cuff tendons away from the humerus. The partial articular supraspinatus tendon avulsion, also shortened to pasta, is the most common type of partial tear associated with traumatic injuries. The crescent and U-shaped tears describe common types of full thickness tears by describing how the tendon pulls away from the bone, and it also implies how the repair was performed. When an individual undergoes a rotator cuff repair, one of the most prominent challenges involves carrying out activities in everyday life. For this reason, occupational therapy intervention is optimal for individuals post-op rotator cuff repair, as occupational therapists help those facing diverse conditions return to occupations and activities most meaningful to them within a level of independence most suitable. Common activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living that are most often impacted may include dressing, sleeping, homemaking or cooking, toileting, showering, and functional mobility if a cane was used prior to surgery. These activities are often impacted as they require the arm to be in positions that are not yet attainable or permitted per post-surgical protocol. One thing occupational therapists can do to help the individual in recovery is provide adaptive devices and education to enhance participation in occupations. When dressing, clothing that is simple to don and doff should primarily be chosen for wear, keeping in mind the immobilization sling which is worn full time for the first few weeks post-op. Such clothing items may include Velcro fasteners, zipper pulls, a dressing stick, shoehorn, socket, and reacher. It is recommended the client sits to avoid disequilibrium and potential falls during lower body dressing, as the client is not able to use the affected extremity for stability. One way upper body dressing can be achieved is by sitting with the affected arm supported on a table at 90 degrees. The client should slide the sleeve of the shirt on the affected arm first. 
using the non-affected upper extremity only. Once the affected arm is in the sleeve, the client can then grab the shirt with the unaffected extremity and place the arm into the sleeve. The hand of the operated shoulder can be used to stabilize and assist in buttoning the shirt. However, the client must be cognizant of not flexing at the shoulder throughout the activity. Showing the client how to put the sling on over the clothing is another essential area addressed by the OT. When sleeping, the client should wear the sling in addition to placing a rolled up towel or pillow under the elbow or scapula to ensure the shoulder is positioned adherent to precautions. When leaving or getting into the bed, the client should not roll onto the operative side. For clients who do not have appropriate strength, bed rails may assist the individual up or into bed. Homemaking or cooking are other areas that are highly impacted and require use of the opposite arm and or adaptive devices for lifting and reaching. This will ensure the individual is still able to carry out the given occupations while in the sling, as well as guarantee necessary precautions are being followed once the sling is off. Recommended adaptive devices for cooking may include a rocker knife and pan stabilizer. For toileting, the individual may use the opposite hand or benefit from use of a tissue aid or water spray device to complete the task. For the occupation of showering, the sling can be removed while in the shower, but the arm must be kept at the side at all times. A shower stool or grab bar can be used to maintain balance when taking part in this task. When considering functional mobility for those who used a cane prior to surgery, the individual should only use the adaptive device on the non-affected upper extremity, ensuring the client is using the device appropriately and safely when carrying out the tasks in the home entails the scope of occupational therapy in this area. Any additional occupations that are meaningful to the client can be addressed in occupational therapy and modified to fit the client's individualized needs to increase participation. The assessments typical for rotator cuff, rotator cuff repairs look at grip strength, range of motion, and manual muscle testing to track the client's strength and movement. Other assessments address wound care and edema in the area to watch for infection and monitor the healing process. Assessing these areas allows clinicians to be well informed of the client's healing process and to use good clinical judgment when making decisions about the client's plan of care. Some of the post-operative complications to keep in mind after a rotator cuff repair include complex regional pain syndrome, infection, nerve injuries, loss of range of motion, stiffness, deltoid weakness, re-tearing of sutures, or failure to heal after surgery. After a rotator cuff repair, there, the rehabilitation protocol involves five phases that structure the therapy process. The duration of the phases is based on tissue quality or strength, amount of time since the injury occurred, if the injury was acute or sometime um, had occurred sometime in the past since the injury, um, as well as the pathology of the injury and the size of the tear, if it was partial or full thickness. Typically, larger size tears and full thickness tears require a longer and slower rehabilitation process to fully heal and regain strength and improve range of motion in the shoulder. The first phase um, of the rehabilitation process focuses on pain management. This phase uses physical agent modalities such as cold and electrical stimulation to reduce pain and decrease swelling in the initial phase of the healing process. A sling or a bolster is used during this time in order to protect the repair, reduce tension on the muscles and prevent any damage to the muscle tissue. Larger tears may require the use of a bolster sling like the one shown in this picture. Limiting certain motions can also protect the repair, which is why it is important to restrict overhead flexion, internal and external rotation, and passive extension at the shoulder joint. Additionally, it is important to maintain range of motion and strength in the elbow, wrist, and finger joints to prevent losing strength in the upper extremity caused by disuse. It is important to teach the client um, the value of consistently partic participating in the home exercise program throughout the therapy process as well. Within phase two of the rotator cuff healing process, the therapist focuses more on active assistive range of motion and isometric exercises. 
The goal for this phase is to have a pain-free range of motion of the shoulder when completing forward flexion, scaption, external rotation, and internal rotation movements. When completing these movements with the therapist, we want to keep the patient in the most gravity eliminated position as possible. In the supine position, the therapist assists the patient in a 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. When initiating active assistive range of motion, limited arc program begins. Once the patient demonstrated competency in the ability to actively control and hold their shoulder at 90 degrees, in the supine position and repeatedly perform this motion. The next step in these movements is initiating active assistive range of motion, external rotation at the side of the body when progressing in the plane of scapula lying, active assistive range of motion, placing a hold with assistance in neutral. This video involves the pendulum exercise involved in phase one of the rotator cuff recovery. The last step of these progressive movements is to perform pain-free gentle isometric scapulothoracic stabilization strengthening exercises. These exercises would require submaximal effort at about 20% for the patient. These motions that I have just described will be demonstrated in more detail in the preceding videos on the next slide. This is the limited arc motion in the gravity eliminated position for phase two. Phase three continues to build off phase two. This phase works to progress the client from completing active assisted range of motion exercises in supine and transitions them to actively complete range of motion exercises on their own. As the client demonstrates, demonstrates increased control and strength, they begin to move out of the supine position to side lying and then eventually progress to gravity challenging positions. Again, as the patient continues to gain control and strength, the goal is to increase the arc of motion and progress from isometric exercises to open chain exercises. This is the limited arc motion in the supine position for phase three. Phase four begins to focus on strengthening the general movements of the rotator cuff. Weights should start off very light when added to the functional active range of motion exercises in the supine and sideline positions. When the client is ready to progress, first start to change their body position to increase the effect of gravity and then weight can be increased slowly by using therabands rather than dumbbell style weights. From here, specific actions to strengthen include external rotation, scapulothoracic to increase scapula stabilization for better rotator cuff performance, and finally cross body, posterior capsule, and end range external and internal rotation stretching. This is the limited arc of motion in supine with weight that begins in stage four. The fifth phase is the last phase of the intervention process for a rotator cuff injury. This phase incorporates strengthening and endurance exercises that are individualized for the client to help them return to specific occupational work or athletic activities. An example of this may be an individual who works in a warehouse and lifts boxes consistently throughout the day. This client would partake in a work hardening program in which safe body mechanics are taught to help the individual return to work and carry out the given occupation safely. This is an example of specific strengthening and endurance exercises focusing on return to work within a work hardening program. Um, outcome measures that are used with rotator cuff injuries include the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeon's Standardized Shoulder Form, the Shoulder Pain and Disability Index, and the Shortened Disability of the Arm, Shoulder, and Hand, which is also known as the Quick Dash. Um, these are functional outcome measures that are important to help um, occupational therapists set goals that are appropriate for their clients um, that are both attainable and will help them get back to their level of functioning that they would wish to be at. 